Hey there, Defend and Confirm podcast fans. Yes, all dozen of you. Yeah, we have a, a, a quick announcement to make about this episode. It's a little different format than we normally do. Yeah. We have a Skype interview with special guest. a special guest, and this is a long form interview. So if you're normally used to listening to this on your 20 minute drive to and from work, buckle up. You've got a lot of driving to do. Yeah. Because this is going to be a long episode, but it's going to be a good one. So it's going to be so good. Enjoy it. Uh, sort of listen to it at your leisure, maybe break it into bits and pieces. Uh, but we hope that it benefits you. Or sneak away from your desk at work, oh. go hide out in the bathroom and listen to it in one sitting. That sounds ethical. Yes. <laughs> now, uh, also, we do a very bad job of promoting our own <laughs> podcast that's true we never russell has an instagram account with many thousands of followers he never posts these episodes there we have a defending confirm instagram account which and i'm gonna be honest yeah. i don't know the password to it. <laughs> okay <laughs> nevertheless we do want to encourage you to follow us on the social media that we do use yeah facebook defending yeah. confirm on yeah. youtube defending confirm you can find our videos there we're yeah. also sometimes on twitter when i remember to post there yeah uh, and if you happen to know anybody who's real savvy with social media has a bunch of free time and wants to work for free yeah send let them our us way. know and also uh thank you guys so much for sharing our videos uh every time that you do it's very much appreciated we're not doing this for nothing That's so right. we hope that this gets as wide of an audience as you can help us give it and if you're just an audio listener and don't get to look at our beautiful faces and yeah. uh, amazing biceps yes you can catch us on itunes Podbean. uh i think we're on spotify now just like us just had, like joe rogan i know we're on the amazon podcast thing so if you have uh, what is it, Alexa? Yeah. You can say, hey, Alexa, play Defend and Confirm. Ooh. Somebody try that and let us know if it works. Yes, please do. And uh, thank you for listening. We appreciate everything you do and share our episodes. Yes, thank you. Enjoy Bye. the show. Welcome to another episode of the DC Podcast. You're Russell. I am, and you're Sean. I am. And uh, we have a special guest on the episode today. We're, we're not going to introduce just quite yet we'll give it a second yeah just a second i'm here i'm here right, i'm here you, you just okay fine marinate over there yeah uh so we are continuing in our series on critical theory yes okay the first episode was an introduction to critical theory and we kind of looking at the four tenets the four main tenets what, what we labeled as contemporary critical theory that's right and then we walked through the history of critical theory how did we get here uh then we started to slowly very slowly uh, walk through a critique of each of those four tenants. We haven't even finished them. We've critiqued the first three. We still have one more to go. Uh, but we've kind of been taking breaks here and there. Um, and this episode is still in the vein of critical theory. We're going to be talking about that. This is going to be included in the series. But uh, we're taking this episode to do something different. What are we doing with this episode? Well, we didn't initially plan this episode. That's right. So this, this episode, we're going to be talking about uh, how we can engage other brothers and sisters, other Christians who might disagree with us in particular areas of this discussion yeah. in a way that's charitable and beneficial. Yeah. And our main concern, the main reason why we wanted to do this is because we think that there is a, a crowd, a group, a contingency of people who would agree with us in our critique of critical theory. Yes. And we are afraid that they might take our critiques and kind of run away with it. Well, we've seen it happen. Yeah, that's so right. I, I have uh, brothers who watch our podcast and say, this stuff is awesome. Also, and they'll send me a link to some discernment -y blog right. that is basically calling other faithful brothers in the evangelical world, anyone who happens to talk about justice or, or the sorts of things related to this in a yeah. positive way, calling yeah. them Marxists. Yeah. Everybody's a Marxist. They've you, drunk the Kool-Aid. If you mention race, you're a Marxist. Yeah. Uh, and and it's, it's not helpful. Not, not only is it not helpful, but it, it, and what we understand Marxism to be... It, it's it, slanderous. It's, it's slanderous, right? right? You're, you're, you're gossiping, you're slandering your brothers and sisters in Christ. Yes. Um, the analogy that we've been using to think through this is it's typical for anyone who cares a little bit more than holiness, about holiness than you do to call them a Pharisee or to call them self-righteous. Or a legalist. Or a legalist, yeah. In the same way, uh, it seems like for people who are very much in agreement with us in our critiques. 
anybody who's like one or two clicks left on the spectrum of where they are on these things about race or justice or any of this stuff, uh, they're, they're Marxists. Yeah. Right. And, and we want to put the kibosh on that, yeah. right? We, 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 we don't want Christian brothers and sisters to interact in this way. Okay. Right. We don't want a culture of suspicion. That's not what our aim is with this series. We just want to ask, is it true? Is it helpful? Is it good? And if it's not, let's be honest about that, but let's also handle it in a Christian way. That's right. And you just introduced a concept that I hope we'll come back to in a little bit here of it, of this being a spectrum. Yeah, that's right. So who do we have as our special guest to help us with this discussion? Today we have Jonathan Lehman, uh, who is the, well, I'll let him tell us who he is. Jonathan, <laughs> who are welcome. You? Thank you, Sean and Russell. And can I just observe that you use the word kibosh? Uh, you can observe. Would you like to add any it's commentary? Oh, it's just a fun word. That's all. I like to use fun words. You're welcome to use fun fun words while you're a guest on our podcast. <laughs> but when you go back to doing your nine marks pastors talk, all yeah. business, no fun words. That's right. Uh, so I'm yeah, I'm the editorial director at Nine Marks. I'm an elder at Chevrolet Baptist Church. Uh, I write, speak, teach, different seminaries. Married to Shannon, four wonderful, lovely daughters. Yeah, they are. Uh, and uh, full disclosure, uh, we're friends. Uh, actually, I don't know how much Russell and you interacted during his time at CHBC. Russell, we're, we're closer friends than you and he are. No. Is this a competition? Is yes. that what we're doing? Dang it. Okay. Well, John, Jonathan and I, uh, we've had meals together. We've interacted. I actually sort of worked for him uh, through Nine Marks from a distance for a few months. Yeah. So former employee. That's right. right. So, yeah, I mean, we know Jonathan. We love Jonathan. If you're a member of my church, you know that I give out Jonathan Lehman books left and right, particularly his work about finding unity in the midst of political uh, uh, dumpster fire yeah. division. <laughs> uh, so, I mean, I love Jonathan. I appreciate uh, him very much and all that he says and does. Uh, so why do we have him here today? Well, I want Jonathan to kind of serve as the avatar or the stand-in or the representative of uh, maybe people who are one or two clicks a little bit left of where maybe we are or where uh, some people who agree with us are. And uh, and and because he's been he's been slandered. He's been called a Marxist uh, at working for nine marks. People have said that nine marks has become they've they've drunk the Kool-Aid of, of critical theory. And so uh, we want to talk to him about that. But we want him to also be representative of all other kinds of faithful brothers and sisters who are really trying to pursue faithfulness here biblically and who are being slandered as yeah. they do. Well, and I also want to be careful and say that those Christians who have asked questions of me, like, hey, what, what do I what do I make of this? Yeah. Is nine marks have they drunk the, the critical theory Kool-Aid? They're they're not all slanderous. No, they're they're genuinely true. asking important questions. They just don't necessarily have the categories to work through how to think about it. That's right. That's right. So with that being said, let's just jump right in. Jonathan Lehman. Hey, you've spent a lot of time uh thinking and writing about faith and politics. Like you have a degree in relation to this, right? Can you just tell us kind of how, how much time you've spent thinking about the intersection of faith and politics and... Uh, <laughs> See what you did there. <laughs> and, and why you seem to so often be drawn into this uh, realm in the arena, if I may mix metaphors. Yeah, 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 yeah. Thanks, brother. Um, I mean, I just grew up interested in politics, caring about politics, did an undergraduate degree in political science, did a master's degree in political theory, ended up doing my PhD in political theology. So it's just always been a realm I've been interested in, uh, which is why now, now somewhere in there, probably during, after my, my first master's degree, uh, I think the Lord saved me and repent. I mean, I professed Christ from a younger age, but yeah. it was, it was in my early twenties where I, I, I would say I crossed from death to life, through repentance and faith mm. and trust in Christ alone for salvation. And, um, um, so what happened at that moment is all of my political interests, especially even political philosophy, political theory, began to converge on sort of those impulses in me to study that stuff converged on the church. And so at that point, I began writing about ecclesiology. I uh, ended up you know, doing my MDiv, worked for Mark Dever, Nine Marks, thinking a lot about ecclesiology. And then through the process, these, these two lanes converged, two rivers converged in my thinking and my writing of yeah. ecclesiology on the one hand, on the other hand, what all this means for the political domain. So you could, yeah. you could say your, your interest is in authority. 
yeah, that's that's been a, that's been an ongoing running theme in a lot of my work. Absolutely. Now, honestly, the whole critical race theory stuff isn't stuff I've read much about. I've read maybe mm. one book on critical theory, a uh, number of articles, of course. Uh, you know, what's interesting, though, is in my master's degree in the late 90s when I was studying political theory, you know, there was a lot of, there was a lot of uh, discussion of postmodernism. Right? That was, that was right. kind of a hot topic then, uh, so post-structuralism and so Foucault and, and Derrida. So I did read some of those authors back back in the day. Kind of uh, upstream from critical theory. Yeah, I think it is. Well, that's well, that's what when I finally started encountering it. Frankly, just in the last year or two, I'm like, uh, hey guys, this is this is kind of Foucault rewrapped in a different package. Uh, a lot of it is. It's just yeah. postmodernism sort of played out and applied to a specific domain. And so I feel like I could recognize and discern some of what's going on there based on earlier studies in, 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 in that whole field. Yeah. And at the time, it was just back, you know, back in the 90s when I was studying Foucault and whatnot. I was just like, okay, this is just an abstract thing. It's crazy, but So Fu whatever. Foucault is a type of uh, cheese used in appetizers. Is yeah, that correct? You have it with a little bit of spice <laughs> jam. Yeah. We're on the yeah. same page here, right? <laughs> Good. Right, right. So bottom line. Honestly, this has not been a field of stu critical race theory. Has not been a yeah. field of study. Of yeah. So, so uh, next question, and I, I'm, I, don't, I just yeah. want to jump in here and get to the meat of this. Are you ready, jump. Jonathan? I'm ready. Is nine marks drinking the Kool Aid? Wait, wait. Before you answer that, uh -oh. uh, Russell wants to get to the meat of Who's it. Who's in I'm, charge of this show? I'm here to have fun. Okay. I am the assistant right. to the podcaster. Nine marks, better known as. Uh, an evangelical Marxist organization founded by Southern Baptist pastor Mark Dever, and its its sole purpose is to convert evangelicals into social justice activists and primarily Democrat voters. Okay, yeah. that's a quote. That's a quote. You're not just saying that. I'm not just saying that. <laughs> that's a quote. Okay, so maybe restate the question. Yeah. So, Jonathan, are you all nine Marxists? Mm. Have you have you drunk the critical theory Kool Aid? Is has this infiltrated nine marks? Yeah, uh, qu quotes like that, honestly, I think are just terrible. Yeah, I, well, I think I think they're I think they are terrible. I think they're uh, sinful, divisive, dishonest. Yeah, maybe not intentionally dishonest, but in their carelessness uh, and and willingness to misrepresent, misrepresent I think they're terrible. Um, uh, yeah, I, I, you know, I'd encourage people simply to look at my T4G talk, and we can drill down on that if you want. In which I say identity politics and critical race theory is a false religion. Right? Mm. It, it, yeah. it proposes Amen. false gods. It it has a false view of sin. It has a false understanding of of redemption. So, uh, well, Jonathan, on that that's, note, that's that's one of the few that's one of the few things I've written about it. But no, but let, 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 okay. let, let, hold on. Let me let me let sure, me try sure. to be a little more pastorally sensitive in how I okay. answer in answer. Um. I think the best thing I could say to those kinds of accusations is what Mark Dever has said, who's far more magnanimous than, than I am, is, look, if you don't want to read our books or our website, that's absolutely fine. I think there's a lot of good books and websites out there you can read. I think in five to ten years, you're going to look over and see that we are doing exactly the same thing that we've always done. And I think you'll be pleased and we'll see you when we get there. Right. Mm, classic Mark. Uh, so classic patient. Mark, yeah. I, I trust I trust I trust in the best instances people are trying to protect orthodoxy. And I would just say I'm a partner with you in that. Which mm. which kind of gets to the heart of our next question. Well, actually, I was going to skip forward. We are not on the same page I know, right now. I'm sorry, but you know what? <clears throat> Jonathan's doing this to us. He's throwing off the okay. vibe. But Take the wheel. Referencing your T4G talk where you said, yeah. you know, these things, it's a false religion. Uh, one mm -hmm. of the questions that was put to us as in the lead up to this is that uh, you say that, and, and you also say that critical theory uh, or intersectionality uh, is a useful ally, okay? So for some people, those those two thoughts are kind of irreconcilable, oh. right? Like, would yeah. you say that Islam is a useful ally? Would you say that secular humanism is a useful ally? So can you just speak to that, what seems to be some dissonance there? Yeah, absolutely great question. You know, in retrospect, I don't know if I would have used that word. I think it was a more politically loaded word than, than I would. Uh, because uh, at the time, at the same time, I would challenge anybody to look at what I said underneath that subheading and see if there's anything there you would disagree with. Right. I think the way I explain and fill that out, I'm happy to stand on 100%. Right. All I mean is, 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 uh, is, um, look, I'm, I'm, a, I'm, a, you know, I believe in democracy, but if, if killing, 
or, you know, defeating Hitler means aligning with the communist Stalin, then, then I'm going to do that. We have a shared purpose in some of these things, then, then I'm going to go after that. That's all I meant to convey with that. And here, here I would say, um, on the one hand, we absolutely need to call out what's wrong and idolatrous and, and, and terrible about elements of identity politics and critical theory and certainly neo-Marxism. At the same time, I don't think our work there is done. So wh why do those things gain traction in the first place? Most idols gain traction because there's something they're saying is true, right? And the history of oppression and the history of abuse is real, right? So that's one thing, for instance, I think an evangelical, conservative evangelical like, like me, like I trust you guys can, can agree with, say, a feminist, right? Now, a feminist is all sorts of crazy ideas that are wrong, I would say, right? A, a worldview, a perspective, even a conception of justice that are wrong. Nonetheless, insofar as she is opposed to the abuse of women, I trust every, you know, Christian is going to say, I agree with that. Not only that, I would say a Christian should go one step further and say, what's, what's given rise to this movement of feminism? Could it be that in the past men and husbands have not loved their wives as Christ loved the church, that they have been? wrongly abusive. It's no good just to say, hey, feminist, you're all bad. When you when you refuse to ask the question, hey, how did you get here in the first place? Now, let's suppose men had all been great, never abusive. Would feminism, like, in fact, I think, <laughs> I think people are, 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 are opposed to God and for their own glory. In fact, I think even Genesis 3, we would say, uh, there's evidence that it would exist. Uh, Nonetheless, I think we as Christians and pastors have the responsibility to ask the question, not just, okay, is what this worldview propounding wrong? But I think we have to ask an additional question, which is, are they reacting to something that maybe I did that was wrong further back or, or, or people that I would associate with did is wrong? So if judgment begins with the household of God, if we're to look for the plank in of our own eyes instead of just the speck in others' eyes, why would we not ask that question? Yeah. Yeah. Can I, may I ask a question, you Sean? May, I, I grant you permission. <laughs> uh, so, Jonathan, I, I appreciate a lot of, of what you're saying. Uh, I want to maybe have a little bit of a, of a more direct back and forth. Um, yeah, sure. So I, I've read the article that you wrote on intersectionality and where you mentioned that it at times can serve as a... Talk? Uh, talk? Yeah, I read a I read a print article. Uh, and same I, thing. Was it the same? same as the talk? Yeah. Okay, the, yeah. I couldn't remember if there were two I've different all, ones. I think I've only done one piece. Of okay, it. Yeah. that makes sense. A uh, I particularly appreciate that you said that the use of the the term ally may not have been the best choice. And the reason I say that is because when I think of allies, I immediately think of shared goals. And when I look at you know contemporary critical theory and identity politics, they have a distinctly different goal than I think we would as Christians. Uh, and I think that can be confusing for some for some readers, for some people, just to pick up that word and, and sort of take yeah, sure. the assumptions packed into it to conclusions that I don't think you meant to take them to. Um, the second thing is where you say in that article that we do have something of an ally with intersectionality, you say a lot of very good, true things. Uh, I think, for example, of how you said that we should look to minority groups and their experience and draw from that experience and listen to them to see if perhaps there is some sort of, uh, let's say, oppression or racism or, or disenfranchisement that has occurred that we haven't seen that they can, right? So I think that's a very simple, basic yeah. moral truth. But I think what, what's in, what I struggled with is that that's not actually what intersectionality teaches. What intersectionality would say is that there is always oppression and disenfranchisement going on for mm -hmm. minorities and that we must as an epistemological standard always trust the experiences of those people as as the foundation for what is true and and that you ratcheted that language back to something that i think is much more modest and much more reasonable we would say it's biblical we would say it's biblical yeah. and sort of self-evidently true yeah uh but that's not intersectionality so do you see what i'm saying it's like are they really an ally or is a ratcheted back sort of non-critical theory version of the things they're saying actually our ally? Yeah. See, now this to me is a, is a very reasonable discussion. Let's, let's let me, let me jump back and go to your earlier comments, your introductory comments about how do we, 
how do we uh, have conversations with brothers and sisters who are one or two clicks separate from us? And and I'm not sure I, I am one or two cl- clicks more yeah. left or oh, right. Frankly, yeah, I'm not sure right. It's true, true at all. Uh, just because I might have a certain historical judgment or a personal judgment that's a little different in any given moment. Sure, sure, right. uh, that's fair. So so what what I would say, Russell, is. You know, to the to those who would call us, label us this or that, just just read what I wrote. Yeah. Just read what I wrote, and 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 see what I affirm, and see what I don't affirm, right? So I I agree with you. Intersectionality is awful. It, it's it says things that are untrue. So you can pull all those things out and you can ascribe them to me. I, I just think that's fairly irresponsible and misrepresents, right? Mm-hmm. So I think there's 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 a tendency when when Christians feel or any group frankly feels threatened like we've lost the culture war they're coming after us there there's a tendency to adopt a posture of of fear and paranoia and make sure everybody's saying exactly what we say right so we're trying to preserve the group and 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 I get that nonetheless when we start to not give people the benefit of the doubt when we start to attribute things to them that they don't say when we tend when we start to see them through a lens darkly, right? We are at risk of misrepresenting, and to misrepresent is implicitly to be dishonest. It might be an unintentional dishonesty, as I mentioned earlier, but it is dishonest. So, yeah, shared goals. What are, what are the shared goals that we have with intersectionality? Oppose oppression, oppose abuse. And that's about it, right? Yeah. Well, now, even, even, there, just, even there, I'd push back and say... It. I'd well, say, you would say, oh, they're going to define it differently. Right, right. exactly. Right. So so sure. we have shared goals with Islam by that same standard. Worship God, serve God, obey God. Yeah, and there's and there's, a, and there's a place for co-belligerence and, say, fighting abortion with a Muslim, right? Yeah. There's a place for co-belligerence right. with feminists and fighting pornography. So, yeah, I do think there is a place for co-belligerence. Now, if you want to just say, I'm not going to work with anybody to oppose things that we disagree on, then you're free to make that uh, that political strategic judgment. Nonetheless, I think some Christians are going to say, well, actually, I think we can work with people to oppose wicked things, even when we don't disagree on other things. We're on differently calibrated consciences to say, listen, I can, I can work with the, the communists to oppose Nazism. I can work the feminists to, to oppose pornography. I can work with Muslims to oppose abortion. Maybe you don't feel like you can, and that's totally fine. But please don't call me a feminist, communist, Muslim, <laughs> because... <laughs> Because uh, you know I'm 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 working to so I should delete that tweet. Things. Delete the tweet. <laughs> so Jonathan, you're you're creating a category here. Well, not creating a category. You guys want to push back on me? Push back. I'm happy for you to push back. No, I was going to say you're you're appealing to a category of uh, sort of an ecumenical, practical way that we can interact with other religions, other religious groups, uh, in ways that you know even a broken clock can be right twice a day. Sure. So well, that takes it takes great care, right? It right, and that's what care. I was going to ask: yeah. is is could you speak to the care of of finding these points where partial truths in these religions may lead to practical interaction and agreement, but we have to avoid being sucked into the entire worldview? Yeah, well, you, that T for G talk is my attempt, maybe a failed attempt. It's my attempt to strike that balance. Hmm. To on the one hand say, look, these things are terrible. On the other hand, let's affirm these things because here's here's what's going on right now. Here's here's my fear, Russell. Uh, identity politics is is getting traction in a lot of Christian hearts. Why do the opposers of it ever stop to ask that question? Why is it getting traction? Could it be they're experiencing things, forms of oppression or abuse or, or something that yeah, might help you just to show a little more sensitivity toward? And see, I, I think I'd, I would probably disagree there. And I think that, so when I, this when I look at this specific. issue, when I look at this issue, I see, I imagine it like a stack of dominoes. I don't know if this illustration is going to be helpful Do at it all. right now on the spot. So you know how when people set up dominoes for these like amazing domino fall over th- videos, yeah, yeah. you'll have, it'll start with just one straight line and then it'll split Yeah. and the dominoes will just diverge and they'll go farther and farther apart. Yeah, yeah. I feel like the initial split between brothers like us, where we just end up in different places, that initial split is the question of the reality of systemic widespread racial oppression or gender oppression, you know, as present today, as present today, mm. do the disparities right, those, we see, do they reveal right. some evil form of oppression or are there other potential explanations that, that better 
uh, explain what we see and, happening. And it doesn't even have to be either or. So like, even if I, if we were to concede that Jonathan, you're right. One of the reasons why this stuff is gaining traction in people's hearts is because they're experiencing some of these forms of oppression. It even then doesn't necessarily follow a, that a monocausal explanation is sufficient. Right. It uh, could be that, it, and it could it, be 15 other really bad things. It almost certainly is. Right, that's right. Yeah. 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 So I would say that. Russell, here's, go ahead. I, I I would say you're right. That 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 split in the dominoes is, is let's let's stare at that for a moment, okay? So here I'm approaching this conversation in many ways as a pastor, not a theologian theoretician. I'm approaching it as a pastor. Right. So quite literally, let's suppose you like me have had conversations. You have, you talk to ten African American friends, and you say, "What's your experience?" And all ten of them, to a person, say, "Yes, I've had I've had unsavory." And 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 uh, very difficult encounters with police officers, and then you talk to three, four, five, maybe ten white people, and they say, "Nope, nothing like that at all." And I don't even believe what your black friends are saying. At that moment, what do I, as a pastor, do? When I say ten of my African American church members or friends are all saying, "Yes, we've had this uniform experience with store clerks and police officers," and your white friends are saying, "No, nope, I haven't seen it." Okay, at that moment, I don't need to. I don't need to have a conversation about reparations. I don't even have to have a conversation about systemic justice. All I have to do is say to my church, hey, church, these brothers and sisters over here uh, are experiencing things and suffering things in, in ways that others of you might not be. And so uh, I think it's incumbent on us as the body of Christ, 1 Corinthians 12, to number one, recognize what they're saying, and number two, mourn with those who mourn, right? Now, at that moment, let's suppose you respond to me and you say, Jonathan, that's ridiculous. There's no such thing as systemic racism. Well, I didn't say that. I just said but all of these thing and I'm going to share compassion with them. I, I assume there's probably something out there, but I, I, I genuinely don't even need to have that conversation. And I'm calling on you as a Christian to look to your brothers and sisters, listen and have some compassion. Right Now at that point you have a choice. You can split off in a separate domino direction. Like you're saying, because I'm woke, I'm a neo-Marxist. I would say that's probably the wrong response at that moment. I would say maybe a better response would be to say, uh, yeah, Jonathan, I've investigated these, I've considered these things, I just think you're making a wrong pastoral judgment, and I think that might lead to a, um, ultimately a wrong historic judgment. Uh, nonetheless, I hope you would show me charity and recognize that I'm going to make some different pastoral judgments, even as you are going to make different pastoral judgments than me that I'm going to disagree with from time to time. Your buying or not buying of the narrative is not the same thing as you expounding scripture. Scripture, let's have a tin certainty on that one, mm -hmm. right? Your historical judgments about the state of racism in this country, again, you're free to have that. You're free to persuade people of that. But back to point one, I, I think you know, you need to be willing to come to the Lord's table and love in the gospel brothers and sisters who have a different historical judgment than you on that particular matter. The third thing I want to say into that, all of that is I think these conversations are just really hard to have an abstraction on a, say a podcast or on yeah. Twitter, or Facebook, I think they're best solved in the context of a local church where there is a lot of trust built up. Because I think, Russell, you're exactly right. Just because, you know, I'm an abused woman or, uh, you know, I'm an oppressed minority doesn't mean I necessarily have the right and correct judgment on any given thing. But I'll tell you what, you're going to have a really hard time saying that to the abused woman or the oppressed minority over Twitter. Oh, yeah. Over a podcast, over, you know. The only place you can have those kinds of honest, meaningful conversations is going to be in the context of the local church where there's friendships and relationships and trusts built up. Yet if you built your entire ministry to kind of exclude people like that from your congregation, you're just you're just you're never going to see anything other than what you already see. So but I, I just want to point out, brother, that you've just proved that you're not a Marxist. Right. Because you just uh, basically said the most important thing here is unity, Christian unity, and that we should be. Uh, able to express different ideas about things within society as part of the freedom of conscience, which Marxists would say, no, that's not how it works. You're either the enemy. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's all power. Or it's you're the, power. the oppressed hero. Right, yeah. exactly. So you, you've just demonstrated that what we read earlier is in fact slander. <laughs> but it's interesting well, that... Well, bro, well, it's, I'd like to think of myself as a not Marxist. <laughs> oh, man, and we would like to think of you that too. We're, we're beginning to get there. <laughs> Uh, uh, interestingly, on your first point, your first pastoral point, that's actually one of the reasons why we wanted to begin to have these conversations. W w it, uh, the the idea that everybody needs to be able to come to the Lord's table uh, together, even if you disagree. 
what we fear is that when it comes to critical theory in general, uh, critical race theory in particular, is that uh, some charges are being laid at the feet of uh, certain members of the church that they are in fact guilty of sin, which would prevent them from coming to the Lord's table unless they recognize their guilt yes. and repent of it. So, uh, y- so we share that same pastoral concern as you do, and we we do see it affecting that Lord's Supper thing, which is just another element of its toxicity. And we're going to do a future episode on talking about the bad fruit of it. But to your point, well, and, there, and, and there are some views and certainly some actions that are beyond the pale that require repentance. And yeah, I but can't, you're, I can't, I can't hold a fascism and come to the Lord's table. I can't hold a Nazism and right. come to the Lord's table. I mean, there's certainly, frankly, I don't, th- I don't think you can hold a pure postmodernism and come to the Lord's sure. table. Well, there's sure. a, there's a certain fruit of this, this view of society the, you know, how much you've bought into con- contemporary critical theory and critical race theory can, can vary. But if you get to the point of what Sean is talking about, let's say, uh, give an example. If you have white skin, you're guilt. You're guilty. You're, you've, you're, you are guilty of racial and, injustice, and you need to repent. And you need to repent if you're white. I mean, that's a Lord's. That's a Lord's supper issue, right? You know, it, either I am guilty of a sin that I need to repent of that would prevent me right. from coming to the Lord's table, or maybe we need to calibrate our understanding of sin, justice, and repentance. Right. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so we got a couple more questions. Jonathan, first of all, you're doing so good, buddy. I'm going to take you out for ice cream after this. Thank you so much. Man. I'm going to channel Sean right here and say it's been a privilege mm, to interview you. A real oh. privilege. <laughs> uh, honestly, this is the reason why we wanted to do this with Jonathan, because he's the kindest, most charitable uh, guy in the whole world to have these kinds of conversations with. Um, so is it possible to be influenced? This is a two-part question. And remember, Jonathan and I talked about how we were going to pose these questions before the episode, and we wanted it to be kind of like a like halfway gotcha questions, okay? So I'm just <laughs> I'm giving you a softball here, Jonathan, for you to knock out of the park, okay? Uh, is it possible to be influenced by aspects of critical theory without knowing it? That's part one. And then part two, is it possible that Nine Marks has been influenced mm. by critical theory without knowing it? Go. Yeah, number 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 one, I think it would be nothing other than arrogant and unchristian to deny that I could be influenced by things I'm not aware of. Part of becoming a Christian is recognizing that I'm sinful and I can be self-deceived and yeah. influenced by all kinds of idols yeah. that I don't see. So again, I think it would be arrogant and unchristian of me to deny that it's possible I've been influenced by idolatrous views that I am unaware of. Of course, my job is to continually work against those and sure. seek to root, root them out, but sure. certainly it's possible. I guess I'd turn the tables on also say, is it possible those who are making those charges, is it possible yeah. we are wrongfully misrepresenting and being divisive in ways you don't recognize? Right, right? absolutely. I, I kind of want yeah. to turn that question around. Uh, is it, so, uh, is, is, is it, what was the second part of your question? Is it nine marks? Is it nine, possible that nine marks has succumbed? There we go. Well, I mean, by the same token, yes, it's possible. The call's coming from inside the house. I genuinely don't think it's the case, but no, I don't think so. Okay. Okay. Next question. I I, 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 I pose it, and I I think it's... Yeah. All right. The the pastorally tendered answer is it's ridiculous. That's right. Okay. This one is a little bit... This is a paragraph, but stick with me. Uh, You spoke at the Just Gospel Conference, uh, which featured... Two self-proclaimed critical theorists, uh, I'm not going to name them unless anybody wants me to, uh, along with a number of other speakers who uh, I think many would say are very much influenced by critical theory, even if they would not call themselves critical theorists by training. Uh, so two, two questions here. Uh, can you explain to someone who might struggle with the idea of uh, sharing a platform with people that you would disagree with on these issues? And then two... Can you speak to second level separationism and how you and Nine Marks in particular think about second level separationism? Yeah, sure. I, I'm not aware that you, you mentioned those names to me ahead of time. The one name I, I just simply don't know at all. Okay. And uh, I, I vaguely remember he gave the talk. I don't think I was paying attention. I was doing something else. And the, the other, the other individual name, I know him a, a little bit, a little bit, a little bit better. Uh, I've read a few things of him. I'm not a what you say. You self-proclaimed critical theorist. I, 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 a, I didn't know that. B, I'm, I've not read anything in that he's written or heard anything that he said that I, would make me think that that's true. Right. So, yeah. well, they, they are. Just, so instead of just slapping down these bumper stickers like critical theorist, I, I just want to say, okay, can, can we talk about specifically what he has said? 
Yeah. That would jeopardize the gospel or undermine the gospel or the unique authority of Scripture. I'd, I'd rather mm-hmm. have a conversation. So you're telling me for the first time that this guy's a self-proclaimed critical theorist. So I just put two guys. Say, well, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Two guys. Okay. A, I've never heard that. B, I've never heard this one guy say anything that would make me think that. C, let's not use labels. Let's talk about specific things he has said that are problematic. That's that would be how I'd want to respond to that. So I, ju- I just can't answer it beyond that. I, sure. I think that's helpful. Telling me he's a self-proclaimed that, but I've just not heard him say yeah. anything. That- it ruins our question. Yeah, right. oh, I, and I actually think I I disagree with Russell. I don't th- I don't think it's helpful at all. I think if somebody calls themselves something, we should let the label stand. Well, I'm saying, yeah, I'm saying it's it's helpful to hear that Jonathan really doesn't know what we're talking. Oh, about. Oh, I see what you're saying. But okay. but I would say now that we know, now that we're on the same page, these, sure. these guys are critical theorists, and let's assume that they really mean critical theory when yeah. they say it, which we know is anti-gospel. Well, they really mean, look, if, 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 let's take it, forget these two guys. If, if you're going to give sure. me an imaginary figure, yeah. who really is... Um, Sharing a platform uh, with a uh, critical uh, theorist. Uh, uh, so, so when I share a platform with the author of White Fragility, no. Especially if it's a gospel conference, a just gospel conference? Yeah. No, certainly yeah. not. Because, I, I confess I haven't read it, but um, I've read a lot of reviews of it. <laughs> you know enough about it, yeah. I know enough of it. So, from from what I can tell, it, there, there's a, there's an undermining of the gospel there. Again, that even I have to imagine this one a bit because I haven't read the book. Yeah, yeah. There. Um, but there's another. So, no, I'm not going to share the stage with somebody who undermines the gospel. Okay. Well, then let's talk about second. Oh, I, and I, now, I thought you would say that. Okay. Now, second level separationism, right? Can you, so, can one, you define that for our listeners? Yeah. So well, it means it, it means when I share the stage with somebody not who undermines the gospel, but who associates with somebody who un- undermines the gospel. So a classic, so two degrees. A, an example of that, John Piper having uh, Rick Warren at his pastor's conference. A lot of people wanted certain people to separate from John Piper over that. And they were like, now nah, I don't do second level separationism. So the reason why I bring this up, Jonathan, just to give a little bit more context is Every so often, I get emails from people who know that I've written for Nine Marks, that I'm writing a Nine Marks book, that I did the CHPC internship, that I know you personally, and uh, somebody who is a... So- they should separate from you? <laughs> yeah. Because I'm the gospel underminer? Yeah. Sure. No, no, no. So what what will happen is, is somebody that is part of the Nine Marks network will tweet, tweet something or say something in a sermon or will, will post a blog post that seems very critical race theory ish, okay? And they'll email me, and they'll just basically be like, uh, "What's up with your with your guys at Nine Marks?" You know, blah blah blah. And my response to them is typically, uh, "Hey, I don't do second level separationism. Nine Marks doesn't do second level separationism." Yeah. But I just wanted to hear you speak to that from the perspective of someone who actually is living out having to figure out where you draw those lines. That's a great question. I would say there's I would say there's a time and a place for second degree separation, and there's a plan of time and a place not for it. It just depends on what the issue and how much of a threat the issue is and how much it's kind of a pastoral assessment, right? Yeah. Is this a massive threat and, and the fact that, you know, Rick Warren, though he may affirm the gospel, Rick is happy to go to a conference with T D Jakes, who, you know, undermines the gospel with his view of the Trinity. Is that such a threat that my association with Rick Warren is going to confuse people about the Trinity and about the gospel? Right. I'm out of assessment of like, yeah, genuinely members of my church and others might be confused by, by my association with Rick, even though Rick is faithful. Or I might think, no, that's just that's kind of far-fetched. So it really is a pastoral judgment call, right? Okay, yeah, so sometimes uh, brothers online who with whom we affiliate in one form or another who have written books for us or who have done this or that will say things that, I, that even I don't always agree with. Right. right? So, um, nonetheless, I know these brothers, and uh, um, I'm not aware. I might be able to raise a, an example that I'm not thinking of, but I'm not aware of anybody who has written for Nine Marks who uh, denies the gospel. Right. Who, guys who make different political and historical judgments than me, yes. Guys who he maybe even believe some things that I don't believe, uh, yes. But I'm, I'm not aware of anybody who undermines the gospel or the Trinity or inerrancy or scriptural authority or penal substitutionary atonement or a right view of the church or right view of about, well, eh, baptism. And, uh, yeah, well, I guess we've yeah, uh, 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 but, but let's just go. Let's go through the main the main things. I, I am not aware of anybody who's undermined those things. So. I don't Jonathan, think it becomes a judgment call of how, of how much uh, one continues to associate. Jonathan, I have, a, I have a question for you. Along those lines, uh, you know, we're talking a lot about liberty of conscience and, and charity. 
Have you put much thought into where that line is on the issue of critical theory and critical race theory? You know, when, when does a brother go from making different judgments about history and society to to making different assumptions that contradict the gospel in, in such a way that you can no longer affirm what they're doing and, or, or partner with them in ministry? Well, honestly, brothers, you, you probably thought about it a lot more than yeah, if, if I've much thought about it. You probably thought about it more than I have. I, I just have a really hard time dealing have. with these. I've, I have a really hard time dealing with these junk drawer labels, right? These bumper sticker labels, like oh, he's critical race theory. Which just can we can we talk about something specific that he's saying, and what doctrinal threat that specific thing he is saying is? Otherwise, we're just slapping labels. And I think that's I'm of Paul, I'm of Apollos, I'm of Cephas. I think that's 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 not helpful. I think it's potentially divisive. So, yeah, if somebody under says something that. You, you just have to get in. I'm not, I'm not trying to evade your question. I'm no, I understand. You, you're you're I acknowledging that hard time. you're acknowledging that that line exists. You're just saying you're not sure where it is right now. Of course it does. Okay. Of course. Well, you would take a case by case example. Okay. To somebody saying white people are guilty of sin and black people are not guilty of sin. You just that's, denied the gospel. That's heresy. Right yeah. there. That's heresy. Right. Uh, White people have certain economic privileges that black people don't. Uh, I, I, I might agree with that statement. You right. might disagree with that statement. I don't think that's a doctrinal challenge to our shared partnership in the gospel. Right. Yeah, yeah. that's that's helpful. Uh, one more question. Do you want me to take it? <clears throat> no, I'm sorry. I was just going to say, I think the thing that's so tricky right now is that so much of the conversation is bumping so close to what feels like has to be aligned. So yeah. I didn't I didn't plan on bringing this up, but I will. The, re, the recent <laughs> video of, uh, of Tim Keller saying, the Bible says that if you have white skin, that you are guilty of injustice. Right. Right. So I don't know if that's like... Did I'm, Keller say that or did somebody put those words in his No, mouth? there's a video. No, Keller he, said it specifically. He really said it. Yeah, we'll, and, we'll link to it in the episode description sure. just so you can all and, see it for yourselves. And I love... Tim Keller. I give out Tim Keller books. I mean, he's. I've, I've actually given out two Tim Keller books in the last month, uh, in 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 some discipleship relationships. So I love Tim Keller. Nevertheless, whatever that statement is, it seems like it has to be bumping right up against a line where it yeah. feels like we're about to cross. He's actually who I was thinking of when I asked that question. Okay. Yeah. Same. So, same experience. And I'm not, Jonathan. I'm not asking you to comment on Keller or that comment, especially since you haven't seen the video. That's just meant to be an example of like I, I agree with you, brother. It's very hard to say mm -hmm. where that line is, but it seems like the re the rhetoric uh, about this stuff is being ratcheted up to the point that I feel like guys are getting a lot closer to it a lot more frequently. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So I, I haven't seen that video. That's true. Let me say this. Okay. So so how do we respond to something like that? I think it's our obligation as Christians Fire. To, to lean in and try to understand Keller on his terms for what he's saying. Mm. I think that if you worked to – I think if you if you work to hear or read someone charitably from their perspective, giving them the benefit of the doubt, I think nine times out of ten you're going to read them more accurately. Whereas if you go in cynically, you are uh, more than likely than not to misrepresent them and misunderstand them. So that's good counsel, like brother. That. That's what we want for, okay, so, for, so, for people to interact with us, right? Absolutely. When they hear stuff about what we right. say. No, that's right. Yeah. Of course. Of course. Doesn't, doesn't your wife want that when, when she says things to you or you want that as her husband? Of course she does. Like, please try to understand me and what I'm saying. Okay. So with that thing with Keller, the way you just put it, yeah, that sounds, that sounds wrong. I, I don't understand that. So at that point I can just be like, you're awful. You're a heretic. Or I can lean in and just like, okay, what, What's the context of that? What is he trying to say? And really work hard to understand him from his own terms. I think that's my responsibility to do. Yeah, and we would agree. Just, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, we would. I, I, no, I might would say, agree. No, I think that's off. I think he's crossed the line. I yeah, but at least at least be that willing thing. to give a brother who's got a track record of faithful ministry, at least be willing to give him a chance yeah. to, uh, you know, to yeah. You're not just trying to throw him under the bus. Um, one more question for you, Jonathan. Uh. We think, we think what, what we've said in past episodes is that any good thing that critical theory has to offer, and we're not just talking about critical race theory, any good thing that critical theory has to offer, we think that you can get it from the Bible without critical theory. Agree? Disagree? 
Yeah, I mean, I, I want to say yes and no. Uh, yes, certainly that's Talking true. out of both sides of your mouth. Classic nine yeah, right? Marxists. Yeah, right. <laughs> Schmucker. Get we'll off say, the fence. You guys, should, you guys should call yourselves building nuanced churches. <laughs> yeah. They're all, all about nuance. So if you don't like nuance, yeah, you're going to yeah. not like us. At the same time, let, let me put it this way. I mean, can you get everything you need to know for marriage out of your Bible? Did you guys like read your Bible a ton before you got married and you came in fully sanctified and knowing exactly what you should do as husbands? Well, yeah, I, I did. Or, I was an atheist, so. Or, <laughs> or did A, the experience of being married, and B, maybe a few marriage books help you better understand some of the things in your Bible, right? So experience and experience and um, um, other books aren't standing in an equivalent moral position to Scripture. Scripture alone is absolutely true. Scripture alone is the norming norm. But I think both experience and other books can sometimes help us understand what's in the Bible. Now, look, I, I told you, I, I've, I've literally read one book on critical race theory, so I'm not saying that we it's, it's, it's a resource people can go out and grab and to better understand. I think, fr frankly, more important than in critical race theory, I think more important would just be uh, friendships and relationships with minority brothers and sisters or people who, who, who come from different backgrounds than you. I think that's the main thing. I think listening to their stories, watching, uh, you know, reading reading their books, that sort of thing. I think that is what, more than anything, just like being married to my wife, is what Christians need to, uh, you know, a, a speaking, having a relationship with, especially if you're a pastor, and it's not hard to find. I would say a woman has been abused. You're going to better understand your scripture passages, biblical passages on abuse and oppression. Look for the Psalms, for instance. Goodness gracious, the prophets. You're going to better see those and understand those as you have that relationship with the woman who's been in saying, an abusive marriage. And so I would say more than calling people to critical race, and, I, and frankly, I never have, nor, nor I would. Uh, I think you need to have those kinds of relationships and empathies, sympathies developed so that you can, you can understand people coming from different experiences and backgrounds so that you might be able to see some of the things in your Bible that you didn't see before. You want to say anything in response to that? Uh, yeah, no, I think that's a very good answer, Jonathan. But to be honest, I'm struggling because I've, I, I'm, I'm going back to what we talked about earlier uh, related to your, uh, and I'm trying to avoid the language of, of critical theory being our ally, or sorry, uh, intersectionality. No, what was it? Yeah. Identity yeah. politics. Identity politics. Identity yeah. politics being an unexpected ally, because as you've said, maybe that wasn't the best language. But all the points that you make just now and all the points that you made in that talk and in the article, I think are all completely true. And I think they just have nothing to do with, with identity politics. I think they're, they're very true statements that use similar language and sort of overlap conceptually. But when you actually look at the, the tenets of identity politics, its goals, its aims, its epistemology, its assumptions, all of what you said is not what they would say. They, they would take everything that you said and they would make it ultimate and they would make it uh, constant. So for example, yes. identity politics would say the experience of the oppressed minority class is always true. You don't question it. Epistemologically. Again, that's, it's, again, that's ridiculous. ridiculous. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So when you say, well, experience is something we need to listen to because it can help us better understand uh, sin and a brother or sister's yeah. situation, of course. We say yes and amen. But the identity politics guru would say, no, that's false because you've qualified it. They would say it's always the yeah. way we know it's true. And so I would just affirm that what you're saying is 100% right, but I would disagree when I say that you're finding common ground with critical theory. I, I'd say you're not. I'd you're, say you're actually... Yeah, you're interacting with such a ratcheted down version right. of critical theory that it's actually not critical theory Right. I think it's just biblical wisdom. Yeah. It might, it might, it might be my disposition, but one of my... Uh, one of the ways I operate when I read a book, when I read uh, something, especially from people who disagree with me and come from the other side, is I try very hard to understand what they're saying that I think I haven't heard before and is true. Yeah, yeah, no, I, think that's, good, I think that's part. I think that's part of intellectual integrity. I think yes. it's part of recognizing my own fallenness and finitude is to assume, okay, mm. this group of people over here, because of God's common grace, might see things that I've had a hard time seeing, and so I work. So, if in the end what you hear from me is sort of, as you put it, a ratcheted down version, that may be. Mm. But what that is is me leaning, stretching, like, okay, what is it? Okay, my wife is saying things right now. I just don't get it. This does not make any sense. I think she is nuts. <laughs> I, might, I might have that instinct, but nope, stop. Shut up, Jonathan. Live with her in an understanding way. 
lean in? What is it that she's saying that I, I maybe didn't see before? And I think we have that same obligation to some extent. So even, you know, Calvin talked about, uh, if, if you know, if we don't go back and read the ancient philosophers, and Aristotle and whatnot, and, and try to seek and hear what was good in them, we... Uh, he says some phrase like we're, we're despising the work of the Holy Spirit, meaning mm-hmm. we're not we're not listening to this common grace God might have given right. some of those philosophers. So as part of my intellectual enterprise, I try very hard to hear what the other side saying is true, and I, I would commend that as a no, typical, sure, yeah, I agree, you know, always yeah. practice, right? And so so let me give you one example of where I think critical race theory you might actually find an ex- unexpected ally. Though so, okay, let's take get rid of that word. Yeah, whatever, system. whatever. Yeah, and uh, 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 might might agree with us. Uh, okay, so right now. You know, a lot of conservatives, I think, are rightly frustrated that you have Hollywood and Disney and NBA hypocritically, simultaneously, like boycotting Georgia, the state of Georgia for transgender stuff, and happily, playfully partnering together with China for all of their human rights abuses. Right. right? Yep. Their, their imprisonment of the week. And I think conservatives are rightly calling that out because basically it says, oh, OK, so you guys are basically only interested in moral virtue when it's financially beneficial to you. It's not what's going on. So Imagine that. Well, yeah. well, you know, ironically, I think critical race theory is a in agreement with you in that. So when they say whites get excited about civil rights when it only when it's advantageous to them, on the one hand, I want to say, yeah, I think that's probably a little too critical. I believe in common grace. At the same time, yeah, there's something to that. So a lot of our non-Christian white friends who are, are suddenly big advocates of various race matters – why does it just so often feel like virtue posturing to me, right? Yeah, and 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 I think critical race theory, is a lot might be uh, 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 virtue posturing. Now, listen, I'm not, and you don't put me in a position where I'm trying to defend CRT. That's not my ambition in life. That's right. not what I ever do. You asked me, is it ever, is there ever a place to agree with a lie with them, whatever? And all I'm saying is, yeah, sometimes I think. They say things that when I look at my Bible, I say, yeah, that's true. So you would say they can they and can get the right maybe, answers from the wrong uh, reasoning. Sometimes. I, I, Sometimes. I, yeah. And yeah, I, I think yeah. that's true. I would just caution that you don't want to feed that rabid dog. Yeah. Because even if the rabid dog <clears throat> sits once when you say sit, uh, eventually it's going to eat you. Yeah, uh, riding the tiger sure. would be another illustration of that, and that's 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 the careful pastoral, right. and intellectual, yeah. pastor theologians to do. Yeah, well, Jonathan, brother, okay. you have been uh, a very kind punching bag for <laughs> us. Um, we really appreciate it. We really, really do, man. I mean, not and not only have you served us in this podcast and our listeners, all 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 dozen of them, um, but you have also, I think, helped other brothers uh out there who may be unfairly maligned uh, yeah sorry i speak spanish and in the spanish we just use the masculine to refer to both genders so but i do appreciate you making fun of my heritage <laughs> and not recognizing that about me uh, but uh, yeah but you know who are talking about matters of race and justice and and who are unfairly being called marxists and and they've drunk from the well of critical theory and and all that stuff so you you've you've served more than just us in our audience i'm kind of bummed i didn't get to read some of these other quotes from uh, these discernment blogs who have some really fun things that they like to say about you. Look you look like you're going to power through anyway. I, I want to, I'm not going to do it. Just one. Give us one. Okay, just one. Be by that. Recently at Mark Dever's Capitol Hill Baptist Church in Washington, D.C. It's his. He owns uh, it. He owns it. A Sunday school class was taught not based on scripture, but on critical race theory. The lesson essentially taught is that the government's responsibility is to establish a means of equality through socialism. Jonathan, is that? Did you teach that class? I must have missed that one when I was a member there. <laughs> I mean, he's almost certainly referring to your class. So how about you don't do that, okay? Uh, and then uh, let's just let the let's let the Lord have the last word in this conversation, okay? Exodus chapter twenty, verse sixteen: You shall not bear false witness against your brother. Proverbs six sixteen and nineteen. There are six things that the Lord hates, seven that are an abomination to him. A false witness who breathes out lies, and one who sows discord among brothers. Psalm 101, 5. Whoever slanders his neighbor secretly, I will destroy. Matthew seven twelve. So whatever you wish that others would do to you, do also to them. 
Matthew 12, 36. I tell you, on the day of judgment, people will give account for every careless word they speak. And I would just add to that, uh, especially about their brothers and sisters in Christ. And yes, Russell, I realize I just said that I would add to the word of the Lord. <laughs> and uh, Ephesians four fourteen, So that we may no longer be children tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, and by craftiness and deceitful schemes. So be on guard, but also be charitable, kind, and loving. Amen. Yeah. Jonathan, thank you. Thank you for your uh, modeling of humility. Super encouraging, and it's a good reminder for me. And uh, we appreciate your time, brother. Yep. Thanks, guys. Love you, dude. Take care. Bye. Bye.